right. Good morning, Eric. Hey, Eric. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. Full on show here. <laughs> Sorry for the whole. So he's eating your chest, Doxy, now. No. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> windy in the road protects me. Yeah. And, you know, you get a little hot underneath, so. So did you watch it? Is that, you just bought that robe? No, this is just one I've been, I've had for a while. Oh, okay. I'm not looking for another. You haven't found a woolen one yet? No, not yet. I think I might be uh, getting one for Christmas. My oh, wife nice. is aware. Ah, uh, you're flying the you're flying the seeds on Twitter for your Christmas. Yeah. Oh uh, well, no. <laughs> She's not. Yeah, there's a, there's a comedian in the UK who used to say that you have to be for men in December. You have to be very careful the things you say you like in December, or it'll tar- you'll turn you'll just say randomly you really like something, and then it turns up on Christmas Day. You have to be, you have to be careful. Yeah. 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 So uh, the reason why I was late is I had to get a little. I had to get a little workout in. I had to bounce on the trampoline first with the kids because, uh, you know, my anytime they ask you to do something like that, uh, sometimes your instinct is to be like, no, oh, there's something better to do. But it's, you know, you don't know the last, it might be one of the last 10 times they ask you, you know, as they get older. Are they, are they going to be 15 years old asking you to bounce on the trampoline? Probably not. No. So uh, I, make a, I make it a point to always bounce when they ask. And really, it's it's actually a really good kind of a wake up exercise. You know, you just kind of jump around. All your tissues are bouncing. Your organs are shifting. Um, find it's really really opens up. Gets like the lymph flowing. Yeah, you swing your bounce. Yeah, now, I always had a trampoline growing up, um, and we were on it all the time. Um, so yeah, I could appreciate that. Bounce away. I don't mind. <laughs> yeah. I don't mind waiting. There's nothing like that feeling of your knee coming up and hitting you in the chin as hard as it, hard as you can. You know, that, like <laughs> that never leaves your memory. That feeling. I'm at the age where, uh, like, if I jump as high as I can, it starts to feel a little like, and this is probably a little too high for me. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but you still do it. Cool. Okay, so what have you guys been up to this week? Uh, well, yeah, I, I guess you post question, uh, what, have, what have I been thinking about the past week or so? And um, I'm coming up on, we're, well, we're coming up on the end of this breath hold course. So I think I want to do something similar for the next like month. Um, after this because so, i'll have well that space of time that i gotta uh that i want to fill with something so there's one of two things that i've been considering and one is doing some type of like handstand training because i never i mean i, I could maybe hold a handstand for like a quarter of a second or something like that um and i think i want to uh I, I don't know i feel like getting that ability unlocks a lot of other abilities. So um, that's something I might want to start working on over the next month or so. Um, And there's a few different, like you could just look up stuff on YouTube and everything, but I don't think it's, it's just about like a diligent practice and uh, getting comfortable on your wrists and uh, taking a lot of load onto your shoulders and everything like that. So um, I don't know, that's kind of something I've been considering uh but yeah that this week uh i guess we have thanksgiving in the u.s um this well tomorrow actually but this normally like the transition from whatever fall into winter almost um so yeah i just wanted to start thinking about something different to do for winter uh skill i could work on so that's what i've been thinking about and are you going to do that outside or inside as long as i <laughs> Uh, uh, both. So if it's nice enough outside, I mean, today, today here, it was even like in the thirties in the morning, but it it wasn't very windy. And, um, and as long as the sun's out, uh, it's pretty nice to be outside, but, um, yeah, that, that changes as you get into December and January and February. So both. So what's the, like in terms of doing a handstand? What are the what's the different 
Uh, what are you what do, what do what are you having to train differently than you're training just now? Oh uh, well, it's it's a lot of preparation. Um, like you have to prepare your wrists for it because they're obviously uh, your whole weight has to be supported by your wrists, and if you're not used to doing that, you could hurt yourself. Um, and then a lot of that, uh, like it's also just getting the right alignment in the body, being comfortable, uh, inverted. Um, I mean, obviously you start against the wall first, um, and just try to slowly come off a little bit. Um, and then over, uh, th there's also when you first start, at least I, my, um, I know when I've seen myself do it on video or a picture or something like that, I have a big arch in my back. So, um, a lot of that is like getting the right balance. So you're, uh, straight up and down. Um, and, uh, a lot of that too is, is like shoulder mobility. So if you can't get your shoulders like back in line or your arm straight back in line with your ear as uh, it, it, that's just something else to work on. So there's a lot of um, a lot of components that go into it to try to get it right. And uh, it's it, it's nothing but just kind of doing it and working at it and being consistent with it, kind of like anything else. But um I've, I've been able to hold a handstand for, I think the most I ever counted was like 10 seconds or something. And it was very sloppy, but, um, I mean, there's people that hold it for minutes. So, um, it's it just walk? a matter of getting comfortable with it. Will it walk in that position, you know, or if I could walk. Yeah. Yeah. And push-ups. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's just a lot of, uh, well, upper body strength and mobility that goes into it. And um, it'd be something good to work on over the winter, because if you got to use a wall or something, then you're inside anyway. So uh, I guess you could use a tree and, and all that, but um, we're an outdoor wall. But uh, yeah. yeah, not very good at them either. I've, I practiced, I was <laughs> during the first lockdown. My girlfriend was asking me what these weird black marks were at the top of the wall in the bedroom. I was like, I have no idea. It's just weird black stripes, I know, moving furniture, who knows? And then I realized what had been happening. I'd been going out barefoot walking, coming home with the black feet, you know, it's monkey dust here. Yeah. And uh, jumping, jumping up and it was off the heels, hitting on the, hitting on the wall, you know, to gauges for a really it was. Like, like, you know, as one does, yeah. <laughs> She's got <laughs> pictures of my black feet sticking out the bottom of the bed and stuff, you know, sends them to my mother to shame me. <laughs> uh but um uh what about you eric what have you, you been thinking uh, about or doing late? well i was gonna just make a little comment uh i wonder if uh, i would imagine that using kind of uh kevin's method of filming yourself and watching how your body moves and you know all the movements you don't think you're making but really are that seems like it would really help with uh handstand training you know filming yourself for definite the thing he said about the curve the back yeah, curve, yeah. Your, your legs just fall over and you don't yeah. even realize you do falling right over it seems to feel like you're more balanced it makes you feel better yeah. when you're doing it but then mm -hmm. when you see it yeah it's, it's really bad mm -hmm. uh, um or maybe it's something to do with not enough strength built up or the right or to do with your the flex of the range of movement in your shoulders perhaps or, or something i don't know yeah, no, I, I would agree. That's probably a um, an important component of it is just videotaping yourself and seeing where your um, your weak points are, where the feeling doesn't match up with the reality. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as for me, you asked what I've been up to. Well, this past week, I've been uh, finally finalizing the uh, labels for these products and about to release cool nice. all right yeah so um these are the things that always slow me down you know like actually coming up with the product and you know making it taste good and work really well that's that's fun i mean that's something i, I do just for my normal experimentation for my own use but um turning into an actual product that you can sell to people you know and look presentable is uh definitely 
not my strong suit, but so it's been a, a long time coming, but I'm finally very close. I have the, uh, the design all done, picked out the, the bags and the containers. So it's just a matter of uh, ordering them and uh, mixing the, doing the first, the first run. The little snippets of your branding and design that I've seen uh, is looks great. Okay. Can you talk about what it is you've got coming or do you want to talk um, about what the products are yet or? Not, no, not yet. You know, I'll say that for when I'm, I don't want to jinx myself. Okay, cool. When they're actually ready to, uh, you know, to be mailed out, then I'll do it. Yeah. It's, yeah, yeah. This is an old school marketing tactic. He's just building suspense right now. <laughs> a lot of suspense. Yeah, a long time. Yeah. But I mean, Keith has tried most of them. I sent him samples. And, yeah, they're uh, great. It's like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you can have it. Uh, well, it's going to be killer. People are really going to like it. So, um, so what have you been doing, Kevin? Uh, the main, the I've been thinking about something, and I've been experiment doing an experiment. But I'll start with the experiment. Uh, I've been. This is something I tried years ago. I started doing, and then I lost the habit. I lost it for some reason, and I've decided it was time to do it again. Is teaching Juggling. myself. Sorry. Juggling. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, kind of. No, kind of in a weird way. Uh, starting to use my computer mouse with my left hand instead of my right hand. Uh, okay. This just sounds totally basic. Okay. Uh, till you try it and you're busy. Try it when you're busy and you'll realize it's not as simple as you think. The so there's many reasons for why I'm doing this. It, this type I did it ages ago because I got interested in left brain, right brain. You know, like different side of your brain controls the opposite hand for most people, and uh, so I was interested like that. But it was kind of sort of, yeah, a random idea then. And then it didn't. I did it a little bit, and it didn't really stick. Oh no! Actually, what happened? I was building websites at that time for people, and you know, you're click using the mouse that much, moving the images and stuff around it. It was just driving me mental to try to do it with my left hand, taking too long, so I just stopped it, and then I kind of lost it. So I went back to doing it this week, but it's purely for practical reason. My desk just makes more sense to have the mouse on the left and my notepad on the right, and just the way it's set up now, I just rearranged that uh, last week. I need the mouse on the left side, or it's a total pain. So I just thought it was the right time to do it again. And it's interesting things I've noticed this time. Is it because you can see it's really good because you can see your hands, so you don't need a video, not really. It'd be better with one, but I haven't used one. Don't tell any of my pupils that, but I haven't used one for this yet. But the so, like, you're using the left hand, and I've changed you know, you've changed the button, so the the other button is the main button. Uh, but whenever I use it, whenever I'm clicking, I'm finding my right hand's moving, it starts to move on its own. You know, I've got like a ghost right hand. But it's not doing, but this is the weird thing, it's not doing the clicks. It's not like I'm clicking with the right hand. It's not that, it's it's just triggering something the right hand thinks it needs to be doing something. And I think this is a brain thing. I think because because you're, you're well, for most people, or most people are right-handed, and for most people, it's your left brain is controlling your right hand, and your left brain is, you know, like tool, tool use side of the brain. So there's something about the, like the, Using you're obviously using the mouse as a tool. You're doing things to get something. You have a goal. It's really like step by step, goal oriented. And when when I start using the left, it's like it's confusing my brain. <laughs> it's only way I can put it. So it's not just it's not just the habit you because you have to build up the new habit of using your other hand. So there's obviously that. It's just like you're just not used to moving your hand like that. But there's some mental component to it. And I also know it's breaking up my mental, uh, my distraction habits. So there's things, you know, the websites that I get pulled to and stuff like that when I'm working or something. It's not the same now because I've been using the left hand. It's, it's strange. It's like uh, the, it's just broken some part of that. I mean, I can't explain this other than say brain, uh, brain hand. <laughs> uh, but it's really interesting. I really like, uh, I really, it's really reminded me of a lot of stuff that's beginner stuff. So I'm used to doing this in other ways, obviously, and I've been doing work like this for years, but I hadn't done this with my hand in ages. It's an obvious one. It's kind of stupid. I should have done it before. So there's obviously benefits to being ambidextrous, and uh, 
for people who are and you know more integrated as a person and, and your movements and stuff by doing this you're less likely to have more uh tension and weird habits on one side you know because like you can pretty much tell if someone what is on the phone a lot you know like or yeah, you, know, you look at someone and they're really lopsided on one side often uh so it kind of will undo that kind of thing for people but also this is it's good for your brain i'm convinced it's healthy for your brain yeah but, uh i still haven't mastered it yet and i've still got the 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 right right click which is left click there um uh, yeah is harder you know the middle finger so i mean the index finger seems to be going fine uh so the next step once i've done this i'll probably move on to writing i'll try and write with my left hand which is something i wanted to do years ago well you have to um you have to form i don't know can can you well you have to form like a new circuitry that that's uh when you were telling me your right hand is still moving or whatever it's because that's the old pathway in your brain that's like it is telling it to move because that's that hand moves when you want to click the mouse and that's how your brain is wired to it. So it's Yeah, and it's like tools, your right hands for tools and weapons and all that stuff. So you're like your your doing brain, your get stuff done brain, left brain or whatever, is is um is engaged. But then it's that it's the other side of the your other hemisphere having to work the hand. And mm-hmm. that the other hemisphere is going to be more like things as a whole and uh it's not it's not as goal oriented in the same way. It's more present than try to get stuff in the future uh so it's really interesting uh there's probably a lot more to it uh if i knew more about neuroscience i could have better ideas about what's happening yeah the fact uh, that you're interactive is really fascinating to me like do you find yourself uh you're more productive then you know you get more work done indirectly yeah i'm slower much slower moving stuff around i was in a rush trying to publish the podcast the other night i was trying to get it done and yeah. you know, at one point, I just found myself just taking a temper and leaping over with my right hand, and then clicking in the craze trying to get it done, and then clicking the wrong button because it's the wrong way around now, and go, oh, fuck, and then in the but like getting annoyed, you know. But mm-hmm. which is again is interesting because it's because I've read that your left brain, your anger of all the most most emotions are of anger. The, sorry, the most lateralized emotion is anger to the left hemisphere. So it was the left hemisphere is getting frustrated because it's not using the hand. I'm not using the hand. It's I'm not using its hand to do what it's trying to do. So and then I'm getting frustrated. So that's interesting. Um, Almost like that, like Keith uh, referred to, like the the pathway that usually runs to your right hand is so well worn that, and and the message is coming from the same place that a little bit leaks through to the right hand, and that's why you get the little passive. You know, right, yeah, must be, yeah. Uh, so yeah, so more productive, but, slower, yeah. but more productive because I seem to be like, uh, I don't know, I seem to be more like it's indirect, but I, I'm more just not interested in doing other things and I just do the thing that's important. It's kind of more, kind of, you know, you're not like use an analogy it's not like the to-do list with loads of things and you do all these unnecessary things on the to-do list rather than the one important thing it's more i'll just do nothing or i'm just like messing like really doing not very much and then i suddenly do the right thing and then do nothing rather than like like what would be a more left brain right hand orientated really productive and i'm doing all this stuff step boom 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 it's not like that's not me at all uh you know that's just not me personality wise or current behavior and uh it seems to work. So it's really interesting. Uh, if you do the the left handed writing, the handwriting, to see if your prose is different, you know, writing with your left hand. I think it. I think it must. I mean, be. it'd be oh, hard to consider that. It'd be hard to like you know actually isolate the variables, but just kind I of. I think uh, you probably could test this. You know, if you had, if you had a way of categorizing different, like say you were writing, maybe you used more kinds of different types of words more with one hand than the other that you you would have to like analyze and have figured out in advance which word meant more or whatever but yeah i think i think you probably could uh my i remember my neighbor i was fascinated with this when i was young because my next door neighbor the like friend's mother uh was is ambidextrous and uh, i just found this absolutely fascinating because it's just so obvious you should be using this hand this one hand couldn't understand how it was possible my cousin was left is left-handed and uh, he was better at art, you know. So I've heard this a lot. Left-handed people are, are often better at art. Mm. Uh, I don't know how scientific that is, but I've heard that. 
uh, I'm not particularly I'll good take at it. art. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, but uh, are you the? I, I, uh, I'm a I'm a lefty, Eric. You're left left-handed. Right, right-handed. Oh, oh never mind. Oh, you're lefty. Oh, cool. I'm left-handed. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so like the with the left and right brain thing, some some left-handed people, it's just flipped. It's like it's just mirrored, you know, the hands and the brain. But I think some people it isn't mirrored. That it, it turns out like their their uh, language center, which is usually in your left side, is for them is actually on the right side. It's complicated for like a small minority of people. So I don't know what you are, obviously, uh, Keith. But obviously, the majority of people are right-handed. Obviously. Keith, you said so. you were good at art. I don't know if I heard you right. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not an artist, but I, I am decent at like drawing and uh, uh, that type of thing. So I used to draw a lot when I was a kid. So there's Can something artistic music? with the way you do the, the way your um, fitness routines and stuff are. Though there is something artistic about the way you do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Oh, wow. Thank you. I never thought about it that way. But, Experimentally. Um, well, I get this is the integrated mindset because you're, because it's, you're creating and what you were talking about, like the, one of the last, the last time we talked or the time before that you, you know, you experiment and making up as you go along with the, based on just having one, having one piece of equipment. And, you know, that's like the constraint. So you have one constraint and then you're creative around the constraint. You know, it's like rhyming poetry in poetry's better when it rhymes because they're forced to re be really creative to make it rhyme whereas if it's not they can just write anything and it's boring yeah generalizing uh, obviously a funny thing um that uh i guess it's just how my my brain is um i had a friend of mine that was teaching me how to play drums and uh like every like a guitar you need a left-handed guitar to play guitar and drums he has set up for um set up normally you have like the snare drum on the left uh like a hi-hat um and all that and uh and i couldn't play like that and he's like no he's like no you don't you can't switch it to a left-handed there's no left-handed drum uh and i was like well for some reason when i move the snare drum to the other side i could actually keep the rhythm and beat so for me there's a left-handed drum set and um uh He's like, it's not really that common. It doesn't matter if you're lefty or righty. But for me, like I had to have it on that side or else my hands would get, um, they just wouldn't work. Yeah, it's the different hand would be the that. higher hand. So you'd be, it has to be different, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, normal, like you you just have to keep your hands, uh, not switch them. So if you're hitting um, like the hi-hat cymbal and then the snare drum, you would, if you're doing it, uh if i was to do the same thing i just wouldn't cross them over but then they weren't the right heights and everything so it just for me i, I was like it, it was super frustrating because he's trying to teach me how to do this and i just couldn't do it and then i got a lot better at it once i was able to switch it uh to a way that almost no one i guess keeps their drum set that way but that was new to me um but yeah it's uh it's interesting i have um there, I have four brothers and sisters, and um, all of them are left-handed, at least right left-handed. And my mom's left-handed, my dad's right-handed, but um, every one of us ended up being left-handed, at least in writing. Some some of my siblings play sports with the other hand, but um, yeah, funny how that works, though. My brother was naturally left-handed, but they forced him to write with his right hand. They were still doing this in the... Well, that teacher was still doing this in that part of Scotland at that time mm -hmm. and uh, forced him to do it. So he still writes kind of funny and but he, it was like naturally, he was, he was always trying to do it with his left. Uh, so it's in, it's in the family, but I don't have it at all. Uh, as my mouse twitching has uh, proved. Yeah. Yeah. So I, something um, in terms of learning something like that um i had a thought about what learning is and um because uh, I, I started thinking about this taking this breath hold course because you have to like learn a new way you're just learning a new pattern of um i don't know it uh, i don't know what the right word is but anyway my, my idea is that like you have to almost teach yourself a new memory and that's what learning is 
So obviously you don't have the memory, especially like muscle memory. You don't have the memory to use your left hand for a mouse. Um, and it is just uh, making that connection, the right connection in your brain again and again and again. And it's forcing it to um, those like the neurons or your uh, uh, the electrical signals going through your hand. Like you have to force that pathway and eventually it just becomes a memory in your system. And that that's how you're actually learning is to teach yourself new memories. So um, I thought that was just an interesting way of looking about uh, looking at it um, for any type of learning, really. But physical learning um, is uh, is this, I feel like it's especially true for. Yeah, and related to the memories is the. Well, I've noticed with the mouse is it's giving yourself rules, movement rules. So like I had to, it was just, I just, when I picked up, I started doing it. I just start, I expected just the two fingers to know what to do and just to start doing, doing what I was doing. Uh, and then they didn't. And then I was trying to do it. Then the right hand was moving a lot when I was, because I was still trying to do it normal. I was trying to do it as if I could already do it. I didn't have, like you were saying, I didn't have the, I hadn't learned the memories and I hadn't developed the capacity to, I hadn't even developed the capacity to learn how to do it yet. Never mind having actually learned it yet. And uh, by giving myself rules, you know, I just said, okay, you know, looked at my left index finger. That is for clicking the, you know, this mm -hmm. is for clicking the the right button. Uh, uh, when, you know, whatever it was I was clicking on, this is the one that does this. And this is the other one for opening up, getting the information of a folder or whatever. Uh, that helped a lot because now you're kind of, you know, your higher cognitive functions are now uh, ordering what's happening below, which then helps build the muscle memory and the, mm -hmm. integrate the muscle memory in the, in the movements. Uh, so that helped a lot. So that's actually something that's useful for people is uh, uh, rules of movement like that. I, I've been cursed for, <laughs> for ages with this thing people have, even, not even, but lots of people have, or you just can't put a USB cord in the right way up. You ever get this? Oh yeah, I think that that's everybody. So, but there's yeah. a, a really quick solution. You just, it's a rule, you give yourself a rule. So I was doing this for a year. I was getting so annoyed at it. I just couldn't take it anymore. So I just sat down with it and I looked at it. And I went, why do I keep putting in, even by the by chance, I was putting in more the wrong way up than the right way up. So I asked, I must've had some kind of subconscious wrong rule in my mind. Cause it was like beyond chance. Why is it always the wrong way? Yeah. So I was looking at, okay, there's two squares on, it, on each side. Uh, not video, so I can't show obviously, but there's two squares on each side, and two of the squares, the little squares, have a gap. They're like three dimensional. Two of them are flat. You know, like two of them have holes in them, basically, and two of them are flat. And the holes go to the top. Is it? That's all the rule. You just need to remember. So holes, holes go to top. And then every time I did it now, some point between grabbing it and going to put it in, my brain has clicked whether it's the holes are showing or not. And then it'll mm. just I'm saying going to the top in a in a side of a laptop, the laptop I have. I know you, you guys with new yep. laptops don't have these anymore. Uh, and then sometimes it might be upright if you're doing it in the back of a PC or whatever. But it's the same, you know, for whatever way around you stick it in, you're still going to be the holes to the front or whichever way around mm -hmm. it is for you. There's a rule. Uh, and then as soon as I said the rule, it just it's just happening by itself now. It's all right. So Not the whole time, it was there the whole time. The solution was there the whole time. It's just you didn't decide to have a rule uh that you're obviously using words but it's just like uh yeah. it's reasoning over ruling in yeah. like habit that's that's pretty interesting uh i think a lot of people tell themselves short they don't uh there's a lot of opportunity to use your executive function to direct your you know your lower brain your more subconscious self uh one example that i found I just tried this one time because I was having really bad seasonal allergies. And uh, I knew I'd read about it. I'd read the science. And I knew that it wasn't, it wasn't like a rational reaction by my immune system. It wasn't that, hey, you know, the pollen was dangerous. It wasn't going to hurt me. And so I actually just sat there talking to myself, talking to my immune system. I was like, you know, uh, this pollen, I know it seems dangerous, but it really isn't. It's not going to do anything to you. It's not going to hurt me. Um, you don't need to react like this. You can, uh, you can, you can interact with it. You can just observe it, and uh, you don't have to 
you know, give me a stuffy nose or make my eyes itch. It's not, you don't need to do that anymore. And uh, I have never had any seasonal allergies ever since. And I don't know if it's, if it, it seemed like it worked, you know? It. Yeah. So, I mean, I think people can just try that with almost anything. Uh, yeah, we, yeah you, I think everyone underestimates how much you've got like internal dialogue that's just below the surface that's that's adding to things that are going on you know uh, you get a negative emotion then you start talking to yourself and it becomes yeah. this bigger thing that you just you yeah. actually created for yourself yeah, um, exactly. sometimes you just need to interject in that conversation you know it's, so like maybe like yeah. you're you were telling yourself there got a little itch and then you're like oh that's the itch oh, i'll be getting the hay fever, the allergies again i'll be getting the itch and then you start noticing something is that it oh, that's it then you start rubbing it and now it's yeah. like a self-fulfilling prophecy. You've started right now. You do have a kind of mm-hmm. there is an irritation, and now that makes it more likely that you'll actually mm-hmm. react to the real yeah. situation. And blah blah blah. blah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, Keith, we're learning something similar in uh, the breath holding. Yeah, talk about that. It's working. Yeah, it's working really well, actually. Yeah. Uh, so the CO2. That's the one that really. That's the really striking one to me because it, it was almost instantaneous. You know, we just uh, once you learn about the benefits of having CO2 in your body and being able to tolerate it, you know, it, it improves oxygenation of the cells. Like without enough CO2, you can't actually get the oxygen into your cells. So uh, and what just learning that simple. I mean, I guess I'd known that, but I hadn't really thought of it like that. And once I once that really stuck with me then i could suddenly hold my breath a lot longer because now the co2 wasn't so offensive to me. i could tolerate it on a intellectual level you know and then i think the physiology follows but yeah it's almost like a physiology with these things it's it's wanting your executive functions to tell it what to do it's like yeah. crying out for your higher functions yep. to say hey that's okay don't worry about that one or yeah, yeah thanks for you know thanks for telling me there was an issue but that's okay because, you know, I've figured out these things, that doesn't matter. And then your physiology will then worry about the next new thing, can forget about yep. that and the other That's new thing. True. And then the mistake people make is they immediately react to the thing that feels weird. Uh, mm-hmm. that it must be bad. But actually, it's just telling you it's diff- something different is happening. And you're meant yeah. to be conscious, reasoning person yeah. and go, oh, that's fine. Uh, yeah. And you're like the leader of your different yeah. levels. I mean, all the different uh, levels of the brain are us, but uh, I think uh, if you break it up and think of it almost as different levels of your consciousness, it helps because then you can talk to it because it's a different level. Uh, But, you know, yeah, I don't know. Because the fact that we, you know, we have this capacity, our our brains work like this uh, means, you know, that you can... The fact that you can voice, you can talk to your immune system, like actually have a conversation. It sounds, you know, like it sounds crazy to most people, but the fact that we have that capacity means there's there's something to it. You know, there's some reason executive functioning is there, not just to, you know, help us uh, do math or whatever. It's also there to, yeah, like you said, direct the direct the lower systems of the brain. Yeah. What have you, uh, what were you going to say, Keith? I know you're, you, you've had a, I think you've had a, you're doing way better than me, I think, in the, in the breath holding. You've been making some big, big progress. I mean, I, um, I am kind of dumbfounded at about how well it's actually working, uh, going through this and like just learning, um, like you said, how, like you, you have an internal dialogue part of the breath hold is like learning how to to talk to your um to your limbic system your uh like fight or flight response type of thing um so in this is uh this is the well this is the fourth week um of the class in the first week i for for people listening can you uh, tell them what it is what the course is oh uh sorry eric and i had signed up for a breath hold program uh, hosted by Erwin LaCour, who uh, um, is the creator of MoveNat. And um, he's been holding these live sessions. Uh, It's a four-week program. I actually think that there's one 
uh, one program left in January for the month of January. Uh, and then after that gets sold out, he's not doing it anymore because he's focused on other stuff. Um, but anyway, he's, uh, he's teaching a program. I think it's called like breath hold work meditation program. And it's learning how to, um, just breathe better, uh, increase your CO2 tolerance. Um, it is a way of meditation. And, um, I mean, th the first day he had us just try to hold our breath as best we could. And I, I was under two minutes is like a minute. 50 some, well the first time I held it I think it was a uh, one minute 19 seconds the second time I held was one minute 50 seconds or something like that and um today I just finished uh earlier I, I finished a um one of these breath hold tables and I held my breath for three minutes and 55 seconds with ease and my max attempt last week um, was four minutes and 24 seconds. So that's, a, if you had told me that I was going to be able to do that in four weeks, that I would, I would, I would have bet against myself. Most people um, wouldn't even believe you. Anyone could hold their breath for four minutes. If you just ask random people, they would just think no. Yeah. People think that you die if you hold your breath for three minutes. So, um, uh, it, it's really been incredible. And, and the biggest thing uh, to bring it back to the point we've been talking about, a lot of it's just um, calming yourself as you're holding your breath, because uh, when you are depriving yourself of air, um, it's your, your nervous system starts shouting at you that I need air, start breathing. This is dumb. Don't do this type of thing. And um, you, it's almost like you have to, calm that down because you know that nothing harmful is going, going to come to you. So it, it's, you're under immense stress and internal stress and, um, and it's learning to deal with that. And I actually, I had a thought that, um, uh, a lot of people, I mean, you hear so many people that are dealing with like anxiety and everything right now, um, uh, just in general, and that could be a number of causes, but, um, if you are not breathing properly and say you're always hunched over in front of a computer, your diaphragm isn't expanding as much, like your nervous system probably knows that you are not breathing well and it automatically has an, an anxiety type response to that. So if you're always not breathing well, you're always going to be in some level of anxiety. Um, I mean, I don't really just I don't, get used to it and you forget. Like you're yeah. not aware of it anymore. It's just there. You just suffer all the symptoms of anxiety, but you don't realize that the, the, you're not aware yeah. of the cause anymore. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't suffer from anxiety, but I could see how someone. Uh, it could be a simple change that someone does is learning how to um, uh, breathe in a different way. Because even the, these last few weeks, I mean, just uh, I've I've just felt so much calmer. Um, and I think part of it is just you're, you're training your nervous system to be more or learning how to talk with your nervous system, however you want to uh, frame it. But um, it's uh, Erwin calls it down regulating, down regulating your, your nervous system. Erwan, I'm sorry, I keep on saying it uh, the wrong way. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a great course um, or a great program. And I think there's only limited spots left. And if anybody wants to do it, I would sign up. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it's, I, I'm, I've been astounded with the progress I've been able to make in such a short amount of time. And, um, and yeah, it's all a matter of just talking to yourself and, and making your nervous system comfortable with the stress that it's going through. And it doesn't necessarily just have to be stress from holding your breath. I mean, you could apply this to, stressful situations any other time but like you get that uh stressed out or like you feel like you're in a bad situation you, you could stop yourself and say oh no i'm gonna i'm gonna be in control here and i know nothing i mean if something bad is going to happen it's a good that's a good response to have but if you know nothing's bad is going to happen and and you could control that stress response um i just imagine it being uh super beneficial in many areas of your life um just because you're not you don't you, you become more dependable to yourself pretty much 
that you're not going to freak out or anything like that. So um, I, I can't say enough good things about it. And, uh, and just the, the, and it's not just, it's not just thinking differently. Like you actually see the physical change. Like there's no way I could have done this three or four weeks ago. So, I mean, that that's actually like, that's physical proof that something is changing or you're doing something different because um, you could try to have the idea, oh, my mind, my mindset has shifted and all that. But like, if you can't apply that to your physical reality, then one, who is everybody else going to believe you to, um, are you going to believe yourself or, or whatever? So, um, do you have anything else to add, Eric, but, uh, about what you've gotten out of it? Not really. I mean, I've had a lot of the same, the same responses. Uh, yeah. See, I haven't, I've actually, this past month has become a really busy month time wise. So I haven't been able to practice it as much as I'd like outside of the classes, but I've still made huge gains. Definitely felt a lot calmer just throughout the week. Um, exercise tolerance is a lot better you know oh yeah yep so i I don't really do a lot of uh like for my training uh i typically just kind of do random stuff here and there little quick bursts of workouts um i haven't done sort of a crossfit cell workout in years so i was training with some friends and they were doing it so i did it too and i was able to maintain like nasal breathing the entire time which normally i would be gasping for breath through my mouth you know so mm-hmm. that little things like that really uh, leap out at me. And uh, when you mentioned that you the increased stress tolerance, uh, that's absolutely true because stress is kind of uh, stress is the same stress is stress, you know, like the body responds to different stressors along the same pathways, whether it's workout stress or, you know, uh, breath holding stress or, you know, a terrible commute it's all kind of the stress is uh manifest along the same body pathways and so if you can if you learn to deal with stress uh from breath holding that will help you in just normal life stress Mm -hmm. just like you know you start lifting weights and all of a sudden you're a little more confident you're a little more resilient in the face of you know things bounce off your back uh this is just another way to build up your stress resilience and it's a really potent way because it's so fundamental to life, you know, breath. That's the most fundamental desire. It, it's not even a desire, it's a need. So it's not something you can fake. Uh, you know, food, you can, skip, you can skip meals for a month if you want. You can go without, a, without water for a few days. But air, I mean, <laughs> when, you know, you hold your breath for two minutes and your body starts freaking out because it thinks it's really going to die. So. That's if you can, nice, you can master nice that, or at least uh, you know overcome it. Then your ability to deal with other things is going to be unparalleled. So, yeah, I really recommend it. Uh, Irwan's a great teacher. He's, uh, you know, the classes are supposed to run like two hours, and he often goes three hours just because you can tell he's so passionate about the material, and he just wants to cover it and leave no loose ends. So. Yeah, if you can get in there, I would really recommend it. The other thing Definitely I like about that, the breath holding thing, is it's a nice, clean way to measure. If you go under the water, you mm-hmm. there's no, you can't hide it. It's just factual. You either, like you're saying earlier, you've either done it or you haven't, and you really are you, at some level. You know, you will die if you don't breathe. It's real. So mm-hmm. you know, it's like oh, similar. Let me, to, let me just add, this is not underwater. Okay, <laughs> no, but in, I'm assuming it will eventually be used. Uh, for you know, yeah, I know everyone uses it for diving. Water is, in a way, easier. I think the longest breath holds are done underwater. Yeah, yeah. I think Ir- Irwan uh, brought that up. I think is because you actually have um, like uh, nerves on your face that can sense uh, when they're touching water, and it, it's another. Well, it, it's part of your nervous system, so it knows not to inhale under those conditions. Yeah, probably the, it's probably the reason why, like. Um, I think a baby, like a newborn baby, knows not to inhale. Um, they don't know that uh, intellectually, but just based on their ner- how their nervous system is set up, they won't inhale underwater. Yeah. yeah. You just toss them in, and, yeah, they float. They turn over on their backs. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, you've tried with your kids. <laughs> do, yeah. yeah. <laughs> One minute he's sneaking uh, egg yolks into his children's food. The next minute he's tossing babies into the water. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, oh, yeah, don't try that. But, it's, yeah, be very careful if you do. Yeah. But. The um, the other benefit that I, I've seen. Oh, go ahead, sorry. Uh, uh, just for myself, um, I I typically have pretty tight shoulders and everything, and just the um, the conscious act of trying to fill my lungs up as much as possible, I feel like that's helped stretch out my my rib cage and my shoulders and um, up through like under the collarbone and and everything like that. So. Um, I know at the start of the course, when I started to take a very deep breath, I would, uh, I would feel like a, a strain on my right side in, in like my yeah. trap muscle. And that has since gone down by like 80% or so, uh, maybe yeah. even more. So as you're using your diaphragm more now, um, it, it's, I think it's that, but I think it's also that muscle is getting, uh, stretched out and there's, there's just not as much, uh, Maybe I had adhesions there or something in the muscle that were preventing it from moving, but just over time, as I continuously do these things on, uh, on a weekly basis, that um, it's just allowing those muscle fibers to move better than they were previously. So I, I do feel like my my chest and my shoulders are a lot more flexible. Um, I still have kind of like a, a forward head posture, but that's that's. Uh, I, I'm working on that too, but, uh, yeah, I've, that, that's like a, that's like a second tier benefit that I also noticed from this. Yeah. I'm really interested the way he, he calls it, uh, down regulating. I like that. Cause mm. that is, it's, that's executive functions talking to your lower functions. That's what it is. You know, like a, a lot of people kind of resist this kind of idea thinking it's there's something unnatural about it and this top down, you know, they want to be more kind of instinctive or whatever, but this is natural for humans. This is what it's for. The your executive yeah. functions is for yeah. guiding and organizing and controlling the, the lower yeah. functions. And we we're saying earlier, they, they want it. They want, yeah. they want a leader. Uh, mm -hmm. That's not, totally natural for humans. You know, and you're, mm -hmm. you know, you, you're not born speaking obviously, but with words, but you develop them pretty, you're born with the capacity and then you develop them pretty quickly while you're learning to move and walk, while you're all learning to move all your movements and walking and running, you're also learning to talk at the same time. So these kind of the use of words to command yourself and move yourself around and to make things happen is wired into your move with your movements. They're not separate for us. It's not like we were these animals who, because like people have this idea without thinking about it. I think people assume they think of evolution. Okay. There's all these animals and they're running around and they're in wild and they're happy. And they're, you know, they're natural. And uh, then humans have this language thing that's tacked onto that uh, on top. But for us, if you think of each person, it's developed as you grew. Your whole life is language wrapped in with your, your movements and your actions. And uh, it's bound to be more easy to control things than, than you think. Because just no one, it's only like weird people like us and Erwin and, you know, like it's getting more popular now, but it's only like kind of it's not obviously very mainstream that people experiment with this stuff and um, just assume it's true because it is true. But um, you sound a bit crazy talking about this stuff if you if a person has no experience. Yeah, it just right. sounds insane. Talking to, yeah. talking to yourself that you can breathe underwater four times as long, you know, it just yeah. seems weird. It makes me wonder, uh, you know, like 5,000 years ago, if these this ability of your executive brain to delineate, you know, to uh, delegate stuff to your uh, lower brains. What if that was, you know, if that was uh, accepted back then, or if it was unneeded because they were living more in harmony and they were more integrated already. Uh, you know, have you ever yeah, you probably need, it was probably more of a, like, you know, the parent, shouts only at the critical moments rather than shouts all the time keep the shouting when the kid's in danger maybe it was yeah. more like the strong usage less often maybe that's how it started and then uh and now obviously it's just out of control for people their words are just yeah. out of control in their head and having fuzzy thinking and it's 
mm -hmm. uh, they have no control over it in themselves. So the the natural reaction is everyone's trying to throw away words now. You know, like get back to the body and ignore all your words and get out of it. But yeah. that's to me that's like a uh, dysfunctional use of in inner speech and on outer speech. Yeah, that, so that's like, it. That's like further idea. segregation of those of those parts when you actually you want a good relationship between them. Yeah. yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Exactly, and also they they're not really doing it because they're using their speech to tell themselves to get rid of their speech, and every time you know they're trying to meditate to get lose all words, and uh, mm -hmm. they're just doing it using it differently and uh, unconstructively. Yeah, the um, uh, there was a um, I think I tweeted it too, and it was a uh, something that Erwan had said at the very end of a course, and that really like struck a chord with me. And he said, um, "Ah, shit. actually, I have my notes here." So, um, oh, people think because they don't like the way they feel. Um, and then they think they could just think away the bad feeling, but you actually, you can't, you're, you're using a part of your mind. That's not, uh, you're using your thinking mind to change your feelings and you're never going to be able to, to do that necessarily. You can't think away bad feelings. The feelings are always going to be kind of more powerful, um, until you could communicate with them better back and forth. You could use your thinking mind to, um, to kind of address those feelings and then those feelings can change over time, but you, you're not going to going to solve your, your feeling issues by just thinking them away or trying to ignore them or, um, or that type of thing. What do you think about that, Kevin? Because that, that kind of like plays right into uh, um, what you Yeah. Do. Well, feel, feel it depends what you mean by feel. Uh, I, and I know, um, so uh, you I'm going to give you the exact quote. I'll have to think about that quote, but the for me, you it's a case of dealing with it indirectly. So, for example, if, if a feeling that you don't want, rather than like he's saying, you try to think about it and to, and argue with the feeling and get rid of it at the level that's the wrong level to do it. It would be more to reason out what you need to do, act on your reasoning, and then the feelings will change, will come along with that and change anyway. Uh, so you do it indirectly rather than trying to argue with the feeling. So you're accepting it because it's just there, but then you're uh, doing whatever it is you need to do. Uh, right. Obviously you want I, I just realized feelings. that I kind of botched the quote, um, but I could, I could read it back and it'll probably make a little bit more sense than what I said. Um, the quote was, why do you think people overthink, uh, so that they don't have to feel and why is it that they don't want to feel because to them, it does not feel, uh, to feel does not, geez, I can't even say it because to them feeling does not feel good. Yeah. I would say that the overthinking in that is referring to this out of control inner speech that we're talking yeah. about. Like it's, that's, that's to me, that's dysfunctional thinking. It's not really thinking actually. It's more thoughting it's just thoughts in words word 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 with people yeah that, that's uh, what thinking uh, is or you know you have ordered concepts and then you're there's a system of relations and things refer to things uh and it's hard actual thinking is tiring it's hard uh, otherwise it's just words appearing and i think people constantly conflate thinking with uh, words in their head so they're not necessarily the same thing but some mm -hmm. words are just placeholders for feelings often for people so if you're just going to use more words that are placeholders for other feelings to try and stamp out the feeling you don't want, you're you're already to me that's the wrong level of dealing with it. And yeah, people feel bad in general, so they want to avoid the feelings. They feel bad, so they're they try to talk themselves out and stuff. So like I've never been a fan of um, replacing negative self-talk with positive self-talk. You know, like you just you have these negative thoughts that people get. I've never really had this, but they have the negative stuff going in the head. Uh, so then they have positive affirmations to kind of stamp down on the negative stuff with, you know, I am, you know, I'm in their brain, I'm a bad person, bad person. I'm a good person, good person, good person. They try and hammer it down. You know, that's 
no one uses that affirmation, but you know, you know what I mean. Uh, whereas really what you want to do is, or, is uh, take control of your speech, inner speech in general and, and organize it rather than just change the emotions. It's like, to me, that's again, that's too low a level. You, it needs to be ordered from a higher level. Uh, it's just reasoning. But it's real reasoning. It's not like stupid rationality where you think you can just think of all these things and ignore the feelings because that's the other. Yeah. That's well, the other side of it that people do. And that's more like common. Uh, well, maybe not more common, but that's in the culture. Uh, so people are reacting against that. I just see this constant pendulum swing all the time. People go too far one way and too far the other way, uh, which to me is a sign of uh, being automated, mechanical. Uh, just, just swings back and forward. People aren't thinking. Mm -hmm. uh, I say this as a as a non like a, you know I'm not a hyper intellectual rational type of person at all. It's, if anything, the opposite. So I've kind of had to integrate that more into what I am now. But for other people, it's the other way. You know, they're far too in their head and intellectual, and they need to get more of the feeling in the body stuff in. So they need to do this kind of stuff first and feel things and accept things more because the feelings were there. They're just not aware of them. Uh, it just depends on the, depends on the person. So, but yeah, I think we're talking, that quote's talking about the same thing we're talking about. It's, it's out of somebody's out of control in inner, inner speech or self talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which is combined, which is to me is not, it's inseparable from feelings feelings and not just like emotions but also your just general pleasure pleasurable and pleasurable uh sensations that's people and i know this from the posture stuff people don't seem can't really tell the difference between uh without training a, a feeling of displeasure or pleasure they can't tell the difference in that being it's a, it's a good or bad they, they it's automatically things are, i think this is probably just a human thing it's automatically labeled good or bad and if you just avoid so you're going to avoid the unpleasurable thing because it's bad uh or dangerous or whatever and uh again these this can all be tidied up with your language it just requires a little bit of effort and you just start labeling things better and expand it you have to do something with it you can't just do it in your head you have to be doing something with the words that's why i love the posture coordination stuff because it's straight into movements you can see in the video whether you did it or whether you're deluding yourself. Uh, same idea with the breath holding thing. You can see it's not like, oh, I you know, I had a lucid dream and I held my breath for six minutes. <laughs> you know, it's like real. So, yeah. So I think that's, I like that quote, uh, if that's what it means. Hmm. Keith, you ever uh, lucid dream? Just try um, a breath hole in there. See how long you can go. <laughs> At least yeah. the problem with lucid dreams is it's hard to do anything other than things that begin with F. <laughs> flying. I mean flying. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't ever lu uh, done lucid dreaming. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Not as like a practice. Uh, Techniques but. to do it, yeah. Uh, yeah, I've had a few. I've had, I've had, I've had quite like a few, you, yeah. but not regularly. Yeah. Um, okay, I've gone through phases of having them regularly, uh, and I've had like I don't know what you would call them. They, they're like somewhere between. A, it's not quite a lucid dream, but it's more like a. It's more like a. I don't know. You just call it a vision. I don't know. It's it's there's the dream, normal dream light life, dream world, mm -hmm. and then there's like the lucid dream world, and then there's the this other thing. It's more like you know. Uh, it's I was real. Sorry, do you I mean, have some in between space, or uh, what do you mean? What I don't do you mean know. It was just like sometimes, like apocalyptic landscapes. Uh, uh, I'm gonna sound crazy now. Voices, it, voices in the ether that but are not in the dream. They're coming from outside in the room. They're they're coming oh, from outside like of the dream. Waking. Oh, so you're sort of awake, huh? No, no, this is sleeping. So okay. there was like sleep, dream, lucid dream, and then this visionary area, and uh, and then it was all like weird shit happened to me after that. So it was like it spills over into normal life. You know, you'd have like yeah. energy rush and stuff like that, mm -hmm. and then weird. It was always talked to you in, in mythical themes, always. 
Uh, mm. But the more this is another interesting. The more I, the more I heard them, the less more the less mythical and poetic the themes got, and the much cleaner it got. Instead of this, all these big dramas and stuff, it's like you have to go through this drama phase, like a kid and reading all the stories. You know, like you're uh, uh, ch chasing the dragon stuff. Chasing yeah. the dragon, I think it was to do with drugs. Anyway, um, but you, you, then later it's just more just it was just uh, understanding yourself in a new way. It's more mystical than mythical. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I never got into making them happen because this happened spontaneously, or uh, you were intentional in in this. It was indirectly. I was doing other, like I was doing kind of uh, various practices, uh, weird, let's just call it uh, <laughs> meditation and other weird stuff. Yeah, there's a um, bit of an eye roll there for just the people listening. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already, I'm already, already way past crazy in this, yeah. in this uh, episode. Uh, but yeah, I was doing stuff and then this was kind of side effect, I think. Uh, but you, the the... Again, psychophysical. Your environment was my environment was changing. What happened? So, I was in the Highlands, Scotland. It all unfolded in a certain way. I was in uh, Southwest England, came in a different way, and it matched. The, it's hard to explain the. It just matched the landscapes and the folklore of those places. The the language in the dream, the sort of poetry language, matched the different places. And I've had one since I've been in Cyprus. It was kind of more Greeky. So oh. that a part of that's just your own imagination. Obviously, you're translating it. But some of it was like, it didn't seem like it was my idea. I don't didn't think of More. that before, you know? I think the uh, land is imbued with certain energies and motifs, you know? I think I totally believe that. Yeah. Um, and then, like, uh, then I would become interested, intensely interested in certain things after that. And then often it would be a phase and then it would be on to something else. Uh, sometimes it was things that were completely different. Uh, you know, one time, one time I heard, I still don't know what it was, but uh, there was like a language being spoken that was um, either Old English or Old Norse. I don't know which one. It was definitely one of those. Uh, cool. I didn't know at the time, though. It's, I was calling it in my, I was explaining it to somebody, and it was like, they were speaking, this woman was speaking nearly English. And I just thought it was like goo goo gaga baby talk. And then mm -hmm. I heard uh, someone doing a, uh, doing a reading of um, Beowulf in Old English. I was like, that's, that's it. That's a dream language. And uh, I had no interest of any of that yeah. stuff then, none. I became, I've been interested in it ever since. So that was you in never, South England, and that was in a place that's like that. You know, it's that kind of uh, uh, town. Uh, so, And sorry. you had no prior experience with uh, Old English? No, no, none, none, none. Mm. Um, and I've been, I've heard of that, like I was having like um, Kundalini type experiences then, and rushes up the spine and all that stuff in those, that, that period in time. Uh, and I've read a guy, there's like a Indian guy taught, who's written books about Kundalini and he, he mentioned uh, writing poetry in a language he didn't understand, a language he didn't know, which obviously yeah. everyone just thinks is crazy talk, uh, but it's coming from somewhere. So, I mean, obviously I must've heard okay. old English somewhere before, but I don't know it, you know? Um, it was all, the weird thing was it was almost the only, um, you know, like mystical, magical, mystical, myth mythical tradition in the world that I hadn't been interested in was my own one. So I'd gone mm -hmm. through phases of being interested in everything all around the world, everything in every part of the world, and I had no interest in the like the uh, what do you call it, like indigenous British, yeah. uh, either Celtic or um, uh, northern Germanic. Yeah. yeah, and then boom, that so was the one that turned up. <laughs> oh, it on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so that uh, was combined with the lucid dreams and stuff. But I, I never, I had a couple of books about the practices, but I never really did them. I was just too lazy to do them. Yeah, uh, I just can be bothered. Yeah, it always seemed to me that too much lucid dreaming could be, I don't know, maybe a little dangerous. You know, because. My my stance is that dreams are supposed to be sort of subconscious and uh, not actively controlled by you. They're, you know, we, I don't think uh, I don't think scientists really know what dreams are, what they're made of, why they happen, and uh, it just seems like playing with fire to be like, oh no, I'm 
I'm just going to control this thing that happens to everybody, you know, subconsciously, and I'm going to redirect it in my own way. It's kind of like uh, if you're just take control of your, you know, your heart, and you're like, no, I'm, I'm just going to consciously pump my heart, you know, or control all these autonomic processes in the body. I, I feel like dream dreaming is one of those processes, and could be, I don't know. I mean, but I'm sure it's pretty fun and cool. Kevin, uh, so I didn't mean to cut you off, Eric. Oh, I wasn't saying. Okay, uh, Kevin, you brought up um, one other time when we talked about um, uh, an interesting perspective on how to interpret dreams. Is that something that you want to, um, or you feel you comfortable enough explaining? Uh, I don't think just now. I think I need to experiment with that again because it's been a while since I, I did it but basically the sort of big picture view is the way to that's more just sort of normal meaningful dreams dreams that seem to mean something and you don't know what it meant is to instead of trying to instead of picking the most emotionally biggest impact in the dream and then trying to interpret that as oh this means this or this means this and, and going and then following that down you know in some kind of interpreting it mode is to uh, think of it in terms of structure and to try and map out the entire structure of the dream. Don't get lost in the most seemingly most important one. Try and account for everything as a structure. And there seems to be only one thing that makes sense where everything makes sense and as a structure as a whole. And it will be telling you that you have a wrong view of yourself. But by but in the dream, you're doing something. Oh, this is really abstract, obviously, but in the dream, you're trying to solve a problem and you're doing the exact opposite of what you think. You think you're solving the problem. You're, you know, you're trying to run away from someone and you're running and running and running. Uh, and then, but actually you're creating them to chase you by the, doing the running or something. So you're creating the opposite of what you think you're solving. Uh, you're creating the problem or whatever. And the dream will tell you this if you see it as a whole. I got this from a, a platonic philosopher, like a guy who lives now, he's like in his 90s called Pierre Grimes and he had, I'm butchering it in my explanation but basically he uh, has a system for doing this it's vaguely based on, on something Socrates says and you the interesting thing is you you are deluding your your you're the opposite of yeah it's your it's like it's like he calls it the dream master. It's like it's telling you something about yourself. Your vision, your idea of yourself is wrong. It's showing you why that you're doing you're doing the same thing over and over again. But it's taking you further away from what it is you actually want, which is a which is a more whole sense of yourself. And then he sort of guides people through the process by mapping out with it with little images and little characters of of the main dream scenes. And whatever it is, when you get the aha at the end, and it's like a physical, psychophysical aha moment, it's like, holy shit, that's, I thought it was this, and now it was this. You know, it's like the end of the movie, you know, like the end of a movie where it just flips, the reality flips or whatever. Uh, it's really hard to do yourself because the reason you're having this problem that the dream is showing you is because you can't get outside it. You're stuck inside the loop, and you need to get outside the loop. Uh, so I've experimented with this and it seemed to work for something I did and it just the issue just disappeared for me uh, instantly not because I did anything about it not because I interpreted it just because it, I saw it more clearly it's about seeing it more clearly it's really weird I'll need to read more into it and uh, uh, play with it again and then I could maybe give a, an actual example because it's hard to understand what I'm talking about but like basically I'm just saying I'm going against the problem of I'm going against the habit of people having picking one specific thing and try to do deal with the specific thing. It's exactly what I do with the posture stuff. This is what got me interested in it because I saw the analogy with the posture where like you can't just fix one part and then another part and another part. You have to somehow change all the structure as a whole. And that's what he was saying about the dreams. You can't just pick one part of the dream and interpret it. You have to get the whole structure, everything in it. And then eventually you'll you'll see a new way that it can be. Uh, but your feelings will really want to prevent you from seeing it in a different way because your feelings are tied into this. Your are impostures, your habits and feelings. Uh, so, you know, this goes, but the guy I was talking about, it goes back to ancient Greece and, you know, they had dream temples and people would, part of your medicine 
was sleeping overnight in a dream temple and whatever you dreamt you told them and then they based your 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 treatment on things that the gods or whoever told you in your dream and oh. this was all just one thing you know and then you were told to you maybe get told to go running in the sun uh, you know it was all like it was all interconnected what we would now call religion medicine athletics you know and, uh, it was all one thing so is that answer your question Keith yeah, that was that was great. More than I expected. Okay, it's so abstract. I need to. I'll get. I need to get a real example. I'll do a real example of one of my own dreams, and and uh, That'd be good. Uh, it's it's quite interesting. Uh, it's the only thing that's ever made sense to me in dreams. Uh, and that'd be a good way I see. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, I'll help with that kind of analysis of people's dreams. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do it for fun, I think, for a few people, and then if it works, then I'll maybe do it as a actual service thing. But I, I don't know if I'm qualified to do it yet, because I mean I've only really done it myself a few times that seemed to work. But then I mean I could be deluding myself. But I, I but I go now by the if it's an aha moment and it I really don't like the answer, mm -hmm. I'm resisting the answer. Then that's probably it. Yeah. Uh, if it's I mean I you always come up with it's this it's that, and then you're like nah it's not that one. Yeah, no, it can't be that. It's because it's too cringy about yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, that's incidentally how I figured out what personality type I was, or didn't figure out. I don't know is it true or not. But I was reading through them when it was got it was fashionable on Twitter then. Uh, uh, yeah, 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 Everyone was talking about. It. Sorry, he's got a B. Oh, on. A little travel oh, nice. to listen in. Yeah, he could stay. Eric has, Eric has a B friend at the moment. Mm -hmm. Stick off. That happens often, doesn't it? Animals yeah. gravitate towards you. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, did you ever get your uh, bees? I know you're looking into that. No, I, there was various problems. But the way I wanted to put it on the land for the new house we're going into, it's not suitable for bees, uh, okay. or at least it's not suitable without a lot of uh, annoying people. But uh, mm. it's just not practical. And then there's another place that was just, it's kind of out of the way and stuff, and it's put me off it. But uh, yeah. I'd still like to if the circumstances are, mm. are, are right. Uh, I just, uh, yeah, I have a thing about honey. It's really, it's really attractive to me. I don't know what it is. It's something, something really, really uh, appealing about it. Um, and the honey, like I talked about before, the honey here is amazing. And I put it in everything now. Besides just in the tea and coffee. Um, yeah, it's always in coffee, and um, I've even like, I've even started <laughs> buying uh, Scottish oat cakes and putting honey on it. I don't know why. I don't. I never used to eat oat cakes in Scotland. What's an oat cake? They're like these sort of flat. Uh, well, they're made from oats, and they're like these flat, hard. I don't know what you call them, biscuit type things. Okay. Um, and uh, you know, like you, they're they're better for putting things like you can put cheese in them or uh, uh, meat or whatever. But uh, like crackers, yeah, they're kind of cracker type thing. Yeah, but they're they're quite filling. And oats is kind of a Scottish thing. Uh, mm -hmm. So returning, you're returning. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you I think that's what yeah, it is. the old fish in the in the dreams. Yeah, part okay. of me was like, okay, all this, all this. Uh, Exotic cypriot honey is one thing, but you know you need to you need to get some of the old get some of the old old country back into as well. Yeah, yeah. So you're just drizzling it on there. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, I'm throwing it on that, and uh, uh, but the coffee one is like uh, it's a game changer. Honey in the yeah. coffee, it's just amazing. Nobody uh, does that. It's, weird. it's always sugar. It's or so something. it's so like I hate, I've never put sugar in coffee and stuff. I never ever put sugar in it, and it doesn't it doesn't taste nice to me at all. Uh, mm -hmm. The honey is like uh, it, it doesn't feel like it's like this treat. Oh no, you shouldn't eat that too much. It just feels That's totally healthy. It is. Yeah. And I don't I don't uh, gorge on it. It just you know eat, eat it. Uh, and. Uh, it's you know, cool so that honey is so, uh, I don't know, so local, you know, like it's literally the product of all the flowers that grow in this, in the place where the bees live. Exactly. So yeah, everything is different. 
and you so know, like the marketing here on the honey is um, like it's very like orthodox christian kind of marketing and lots of stuff you know so it's really like there's some beautiful uh, labels and stuff and the names you know um, post some pictures on it yeah well i'll start i'll start um honey honey trapping uh, yeah on twitter uh so yeah maybe one day i'll, I'll make me one but also that was one of the things that triggered the idea was your you had a long post on twitter eric it was really interesting about uh, best foods to uh store long term for survival mm-hmm. and i was thinking you know honey's obviously yeah effectively it'll infinite, last forever. that kind of thing as long as you avoid water it'll just last forever you know you also got a great thread on honey I happen to retweet it today. Oh, I haven't yeah. seen that. Okay, cool. I'll check that one out. Yeah. No, that, that one's really good. Very sincere, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I can be sincere. I always am. Yeah. <laughs> uh, man, all that from that damn bee really wanted us to talk about honey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No wonder yeah. it showed up. I, was re- I mean, it's weird. I saw it, like, I looked up and I saw it coming from all the way across the valley, you know, you can kind of see it shining and it just landed right on my finger. It's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah don't act like you don't have some superpower or something like that. That's, <laughs> you're like Aquaman for bees. <laughs> Maybe. Usually it's spiders. It's usually those little jumping spiders that land on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Time traveling spiders. Yeah, somehow the conversation about spider honey wouldn't have been as good, though. Mm-mm. I'd eat it if they made it. Spider honey? If yeah, it was, it, would, it existed, sure. I think it would be a redeeming feature, yeah. Yeah. So, what else have we been up to? For sure, we call it a day. Yeah, it's getting ready for Thanksgiving. Yeah. So where are you now, uh, Keith? You said you're in a different time zone. No, uh, I'm still in the same time zone. I always am, but my mind was somewhere else because uh, I don't know why. Okay, psychophysical. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I wish I could say it. there was some reason why I, my, I don't know, I had a mental lapse but uh no i was just I'm just eager you're ready to go yeah yeah you know i was i, I was thinking because we have to coordinate three different time zones over a large span of time and yeah, uh, yeah and i think my mind went to um eric's time zone but not really because it was he's three hours mm-hmm. ahead of or behind me and I only went two hours, so I don't know what happened. Since but we web- started doing this together, I've noticed how many of Eric's uh, tweets I miss on Twitter oh. because of the time zones. Because I'm like ten yeah. hours ahead of you, and uh, I was like, and I had the you know set up the the podcasts uh, account on Twitter. And because there's, I'm only following us. It's showing, it's showing things that we've liked and replies and stuff. The three of us, you know, it's like populating with all these things I've missed. And I was like, tons of your stuff I've missed for ages now. Mm. So, I mean, it might be quite good from the podcast point of view because we're one of us is talking about it all the time. But uh, from my point of view, it's a bit annoying. So, so uh, it's an annoying time zone I'm in. Uh, most of my lessons with people are late at night, not late at night, but later in the day. Which is good, so I don't need to get up early. But it's also it's you know it takes it uses up it restricts your day. Happens yeah. At most people, most most people in America. But anyway, what, what time are you then? Then so right now. What's that? Yeah. What time is it for you, Kevin? Right now. Uh, it's uh, almost quarter past ten, night. Okay. Yeah, it's so like. Um, so my brain's usually more tired and stuff at this time, but this is obviously the only time we can, we can do this. Yeah, yeah, it is tough, but I mean, what? I mean, once a week. No, it's, an, it's inevitable. I'm going to be drinking at some point soon. Uh, right. this, especially Welcome, on Friday. Yeah, yeah. Then I'll tell the real crazy stories. I mean, I would. 
if, if you drink, I'll drink too. Uh, <laughs> okay. Even though it'll be you know, 10 in the morning, but it's okay. Yeah. Will, will your be will your be minions still come to you though if you change your scent? Uh, I think so. Or maybe you have yeah. to drink mead. If you drink mead, you'll be fine. Yeah, there you go. I'll drink it. <laughs> oh, this one's been fun. This is really fun. Yeah. Just uh, random. Good for you. It'll keep getting better too. I feel a lot more comfortable than I did yep. uh, a couple weeks ago or whenever. Yeah, me too. It's the it's the two realities, the reality of just talking, and then there's the there's people are listening to this that don't exist yet <laughs> in the future, and you're kind of always second guessing yourself mind. sometimes. Yeah, it's always in the back of your mind, at least yeah. mine. That yeah, because the, the whole time they end up like, should I tell the story? Should I say that? Should I? What part should I edit? And then I forgot to edit the bit I meant to edit. So fuck it. It's in there. <laughs> um, the oh, people the, know that about me now, I guess.